I thank the Scottish Economic Society for asking me um, the thoughts of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research as we go into 2024, which will almost certainly be an election year. Uh, when the election is, we don't know yet, but it, it seems increasingly likely it will be in the early part of the year. And that ought to focus our attentions on the problems that society across the United Kingdom is facing. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to talk to the Scottish Economic Society. It's, it has a history stretching back to 1897 and the role and contribution of Scottish e economists globally in the UK has been profoundly important over that period. Um, so I'm delighted that I have a chance here to sort of explore some issues with you that I know colleagues who are members of the Scottish Economic Society will be thinking very hard about um, and have been thinking very hard about. And the main problem facing the UK at the moment is manifested itself in the words, the cost of living crisis. This is the idea that, uh, well, not idea, the observation that the prices of um, common goods, food, energy, um, utilities have escalated in a manner to leave the income that is left over from people once they've paid their bills severely depleted. And at the same time, to combat that increase in those prices, the Bank of England has raised bank rate from 0.1 of a percent to 5.2 percent in sequence of steps stretching back to December 2021, which then means that anyone who has mortgage debt or credit card debt and is also paying rent. It seems to me that alongside this process, rents have also gone up in, large, in parts of the country as well in an unanticipated manner. Um, average rental growth in the last year or so has been 6 to 8%, which of course is then further depleting the uh, uh, ability of households not only to meet their bills, but to have something left over for discretionary expenditure. Um, and even though inflation is starting to come down, inflation, as we all know, is the rate of change of prices. That doesn't mean that the elevated level of energy, food, transport, utilities doesn't persist. And that is a problem, therefore, that we're going to continue to face in society, for particularly for those in the lower income brackets. We've seen particular impact of those in the bottom two deciles in the last couple of years, and that's coming on top of the burden that they had to face during COVID and the continuing impact of, of Brexit on business investment and opportunities for people. So it's been a very tough few years uh, for people across the country. And, and even though we seem to be in a more stable position than we were at this time last year, if you remember the aftermath of the mini budget, and I was very pleased to be able to come up to Scotland, the Creef, in fact, and talk to members of the Scottish Economic Society about the mini budget at the time, how we'd almost lost control, it seemed to me, of our macroeconomic management. But we seem to have got it into place. But short term macroeconomic management is about adjusting to shocks. It's not actually about changing the structure of the economy. And it's clear from our responses to the cost of living crisis and the other things that I've discussed that the structure of the British economy needs some fundamental change. I think one of the interesting things is, is that, disappointing things, is that the British economy has not grown in the way we an, would have anticipated 15 or, year, 15 or so years ago. Productivity growth, the growth in income per head, broadly speaking, has barely been at half a percent over that period compared to a post-World War II average of around 2%. These are huge differences. Doubling every 36 years is something we all got accustomed to. And now we're in a world in which it seems like we're not growing at all. Has a number of manifestations that we need to think about. A large part of the counterpart of that low level of growth in average income is that actually incomes at the bottom are particularly stagnated. So the average has been pulled down by a lack of growth at the bottom of the income distribution. That in itself reflects a productivity problem. Firms cannot pay the people who work for them higher wages because the level of productivity of those firms is not what we'd have anticipated. And one of the reasons that the level of productivity of those firms is lower is a lack of human capital skills that firms have a ro role in developing, as does the state in terms of vocational and further education. Um, and 
there's also an absence of physical capital and intangible capital, whether it's IT structures, broadband networks, or just simple capital in terms of machinery, plant and equipment. There does seem to be a shortage in aggregate in the UK compared to our trading partners. And this seems to be something that is driving these low levels of productivity. So we end up in a world in which wages are lower than they ought to have been, uh, ought, to, ought to be. We're also at a level much worse off than we would have anticipated a generation ago, and that leads to disappointment and confusion uh, out there. But as well, we want first world, frontier levels of public sector provision in health, schools, roads, and infrastructure. But if the size of the economy is, we estimate, some 10 to 12% lower than it would otherwise have been, given the trends we saw prior to the financial crisis, there's not enough tax base around. There's sufficient, insufficient resources to fund the level of services that the economy requires. But if we want to provide those services, in the absence of ability to raise tax revenues, what we end up with are a sequence of fiscal deficits and we get the public debt ballooning in the way that it has. We've ended up now a world in which debt prior to the financial crisis, public debt was well under 40% of GDP, is now seems to be stuck at about 100% of GDP. And in part, that's because the tax base has shrunk um, relative to our expectations. But our demand for public services, rightly, has stayed at first or advanced country levels. And the solution to all of this is to nurture productivity in the economy, to think about the interventions that will grow the economy in the medium term. This is not something that can be done overnight, uh, as we learned last year at the time of the mini budget. This is something that requires detailed, careful interventions at the local level, backed by central government, to bring up our cities and towns and regions, whether they're in Scotland or Wales, Northern Ireland, or in our other regions in the Northeast as well, which seems to have relatively low wages compared to the rest of the country. And of course, the West Midlands, which has been particularly hit by Brexit in our analysis as well. Um, how do we formulate and back those plans to bring these places uh, back up to where they should be and regenerate them? And that's something which is going to require a very long-term lens, not an overnight lens. In fact, something that will require foresight by our politicians to make decisions that they won't necessarily benefit from within the economic cycle or the political cycle, I should say. These are decisions that might well have benefits for future generations rather than the ones who are currently in power. And how we think more long run and act more long run, it seems to be the critical problem facing uh, the British economy. And that feeds into questions on climate change, questions on equality, uh, and questions of bringing the country together. One unfortunate aspect seems to me of the growth that we have had in the last 15 years, is that it's increasingly revealed a kind of two-speed economy. Those bits that can benefit from high human capital, strong networks, large pools of labor, so the financial sector, accountancy, law, IT services, have had wages that have done reasonably well and growth rates that look reasonably good if we look at the growth of London and the Southeast. But there are pools of stagnation around the country that have not done very well in this period. And it's hard to measure any perceptible improvement in their welfare or standards of living. And that is creating um, more levels of inequality than I think we ought to feel comfortable with within a country. And the question is, how do we address that in a manner that fundamentally changes the prospects of people who are, to coin a phrase, feeling as though they've been left behind?